Hello, in this video we're going to discuss the Code of Ethics for Georgia Educators, which is put forth by the Georgia Professional Standards Commission, or the PSC. The PSC is the group of people who issue teachers their license. So, um, in doing so, they also have a Code of Ethics that teachers must follow in order to get and retain their license. When you look at the documents uh, regarding the Code of Ethics, you'll know that you'll notice that it's sometimes difficult to understand because a lot of it is written in legal writing. So we're going to attempt to break some of this information down for you. So one thing to keep in mind is the definition of what is to be called an educator. And that is someone who is holding or applying or has been denied um, a certificate issued by the Georgia Standards uh, Commission. So basically, um, anyone who has a license or is applying for a license or has ever had a license falls under and must follow these code of ethics. Another definition you definitely want to make sure you understand is the role of a student. So that's any individual in a state, public, or private school from pre-K through 12th grade. It is also defined as anyone between the ages of 3 and 17. So that is when you hear the word student, that's covering you know pre-K all the way up to 12th grade. So there are 10 standards and we're going to attempt right now to kind of break each of them down for you and look at each one and kind of explain what each one involves. So the standard one is legal compliance against criminal acts, which basically means that the educator uh, must also follow all federal, state, and local laws. So if one uh, breaks federal, state, or local law, they're also breaking the code of ethics. There is a statement in there that uh, speaks about unethical conduct, including but not limited to um, conviction of felonies or any crime involving moral turpitude. So what exactly is moral turpitude? Let's look at some um, actions that you can take to uh, fall into that category. So these are a listing of some crimes that fall into moral turpitude, which is basically um, questioning the morals of the individual. So a lot of it is lying, theft, um, sale of illegal drugs, false reporting, um, voluntary manslaughter, criminal background check, uh, bad bad criminal uh, background checks, um, not filing federal taxes. So again, it's not necessarily always the most severe of um, of crimes. So we're not just talking murder, manslaughter, that kind of thing. We're also talking things that, um, things like failing to report a crime um, or false pretenses or things like that. So anything that is questioning one's morals in that regard. So interestingly, there is a list that also um, that does not involve moral turpitude, and these are kind of listed here. Um, so this is interesting um, that these these actions do not fall within this. Now, having said that, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that if a person, if a student, or if a teacher breaks these, um, that that means that he or she will not be in trouble because he or she probably will since these all are still fate, uh, federal and state crimes. So I'm um, just knowing kind of the difference between what moral turpitude is, but keeping in mind that um, the teacher's probably going to be in trouble if they do any of these things because it is going to be probably breaking state um, or federal law. Notice on the um, list of what is moral turpitude, one of the uh, statements is failure to report a crime history. And so if you've ever filled out an application for employment, you've probably seen questions like, do you have any pending charges? Have you had any adverse action taken against you? Have you been convicted of a felony? Have you lost a job while you were under investigation of a crime? That kind of thing. Um, so you have to answer these honestly because lying on an application um, when they if they find out that you have lied then that does break the code of ethics and they can revoke your certificate for that so um you want to be very careful about how you answer those questions oftentimes if you do answer yes um, there might be a place for you to explain yourself or you might want to make a note um, that you are able to explain what happened in this situation if you do have to answer yes to any of these um, questions the next standard can also sometimes get teachers in trouble, and that is conduct with students. So um, the statement itself is that educators must maintain professional relationships with students inside and outside of the classroom. So it does define 
outside of the classroom so it's not just what's happening uh, within the the um, you know eight to three realm of things so for the most part um, you know some of these are obvious no child abuse obviously no cruelty to children or child endangerment obviously um, no committing or soliciting of sexual acts obviously um, no harassments of students so you can't discriminate on students by race gender religion disability now sometimes that can be difficult um, in some situations because again this is looking at their sexual preferences this is looking at their gender preferences this is looking at their religion so um, despite what your personal opinion is as an individual your role as a teacher is to educate these students so you cannot harass or discriminate on those students based upon their life choices in that regard um, also, inappropriate relationships with students can sometimes get teachers in trouble. Um, this involves writing, verbal, or physical, remember, in or outside of school. Um, I will make a note that uh, what often gets people in trouble in this regard is social media. Um, so, I would definitely encourage you to not befriend your students on social media, to make all of your accounts private um, so that you know, students aren't able to see what you post, parents aren't able to see what you post, I would be careful about friending parents. Um, a lot of teachers have decided to just create, if they are going to use social media to communicate with teacher or to communicate with their parents, they make a separate classroom page that they use only for professional type things. Um, so you want to be very careful about how you interact with students on social media inside and outside of school. And that also includes things like texting, um, any type of electronic communication. And then, of course, not providing students um, illegal drugs, alcohol, tobacco, those type things. So here's a listing of a couple of things that, um, you know, fall into this that people have done before. Um, and so some of these are obvious um, that I would imagine most teachers would would not do. Um, but certain things like calling students names, even if you're just joking, avoid it because it is technically breaking. Um, videotaping students um, in compromising acts so you know if they're sleeping in the classroom or if they're doing something and you pull out your phone and videotape them um, to make a point keep in mind that you know you could very well be breaking the code of ethics um, one that can sometimes get get teachers in trouble is leaving students unsupervised so you want to be very careful about hey I'm gonna run down the the hallway to the bathroom y'all sit in your desk and do your work or hey um, I this child fell on the playground I need to run him to the the nurse um, I'm gonna leave you guys outside for a couple of minutes you know I'm going to leave another kid in charge while I run in and take this kid to the nurse. Um, you cannot leave your students unsupervised. So that can sometimes get students or teachers in trouble. So again, here are some suggestions. Don't friend your students on your social networks. Have private, uh, have private settings. Um, avoid calling students on personal phones if you can. Maybe use an office phone or the, the uh, phone in the office building, that kind of thing. Um, if, you're, if you're wary against giving students your personal phone number, you might use something like a Google number to where you create an account um, and they're able to call you through that. I mean, it's not your personal number. A lot of people use apps like remind or things like that to where you're texting them through the app and it's not texting through your actual phone um, only use your school email don't tell offensive jokes don't gossip with or about students don't go to parties of students um, now this is different than a five-year-old's birthday party you know this is more like middle school high school having a party and um, they might be doing things that potentially might might lead to some trouble or might get them in trouble I just wouldn't go and involve myself um, and then don't on your social media don't post compromising photos things with you drinking or in compromising positions or doing compromising things um, it's best if you just keep those uh, networks private so that students and parents aren't able to see those so the next one deals with uh, standard three deals with alcohol and drugs and so basically it's saying that a teacher cannot use alcohol or drugs while uh, during their professional practice so um, most of the time people think of this as the regular school day so from eight o'clock to um, you know three o'clock but it actually involves being on school premises for any school related activity um, so that could include things like teacher work days professional development um, sometimes you know the thought is okay we're having professional development at lunch all the teachers will go out we'll have a couple drinks we'll come back we'll finish up um, no students are on campus so it's 
fine and that actually you're still at work and so that is still considered um, breaking the code of ethics. Um, also, if you go on school related field trips, if you do things with like the booster club or parent teacher groups or things like that, um, if you go on a trip to say Washington DC or somewhere like that and you take the students overnight on a on a uh, field trip you are still considered at school so you're still not able to participate in anything um, involving alcohol and drugs because again that is breaking the code of ethics Standard four is very much overarching. Um, it's basically an educator should exemplify honesty and integrity. Um, here are some examples. Um, if you do leave, um, if you're talking leave or absences, you want to make sure that you're being honest. Um, in, in years past, there's been issues where teachers have wanted to go on vacation or wanted to go to do something, go to a football game, go to a baseball game or whatever, and they would say that they were sick and take a professional day, um, a sick day when actually they were not. So that is, um, you know, lying for your leave and you want to make sure not to do that. Um, be honest when you're, you know, evaluating your students and other faculty members. You want to be um, true in your criminal history, your qualification, your degrees, your certification, your employment history, even your college credit, um, and anything that you've submitted to government agency or investigations. Now, these are just some general things, but these are not all of them. So, again, the idea is just to be 100% crystal clear, honest in all situations. Standard number five speaks of public funds and property, um, and sometimes teachers fall into this category, um, If, especially if you're like a club sponsor or a coach or something like that, you'll fall into this category. It used to be that the teacher would keep money for things like field trips, things like that. Oftentimes now that is pushed to the bookkeeper or someone in the office that handles the money side of things so that teachers don't have to worry about that anymore. But a couple of problems that usually occur within this standard is misusing or stealing school funds which again um, usually only you only you usually have access to school funds if you are like a coach or a club sponsor nowadays um, not ac accounting for funds that were given from parents or students things like you know um, ice cream money t-shirt money that kind of thing um, using schools facilities inappropriately or without permission so you know if you are having an event on the weekend um, after school you want to make sure you go through the proper channels to get approval even if it's for a sports related activity even it's even if it's for a club you want to make sure that you get um, the appropriate okay to be able to use that facility usually that involves having maybe filling out a form that kind of thing you want to be careful about mixing school money with your personal money i um, in years past there have been teachers who you know did collect t-shirt money did collect um, you know, ice cream money, whatever, and they would put it in their personal bank accounts and then write one big fact check um, out to pay for the t-shirts. Um, you want to make sure not to avoid, you want to avoid doing that and keep the accounts separate. But again, most of the time now, a bookkeeper or someone in the office handles all of that. And then, of course, you know, being careful about what you submit repayment and reimbursement for. Um, if you do travel or something like that and you are allowed to submit reimbursement, make sure you have all your receipts and all of that kind of information, your, your data, your um, evidence all intact for when you apply for reimbursement. Standard six is very similar, um, and it has to do with... Uh, accepting gifts or gratuities or favors or any type of compensation. Um, so common things would be having students buy things. Um, there was actually something that came on a couple years ago through the news to where the teacher was giving students extra credit if they brought her beanie babies because she collected beanie babies, you know, the little stuffed um, kind of like stuffed animals with beans in them. Um, and so that, you know, is illegal. You cannot ask students or parents to buy you something in exchange for extra credit or higher grades or what have you. You also cannot accept gifts for from vendors for personal use. So say that you're the baseball coach and um, that you cannot accept um you know, Braves tickets uh, for your family um, by, you know, Spons or by telling the students to, you know, wear Braves caps or you can't, you know, get things from, you know, get get free Adidas um, gift cards by choosing to have your team purchase Adidas shoes for the, the year. You can't accept um, any type of, of um, gifts from vendors for personal use. 
Two that are definitely interesting that you want to make note of. One is like tutoring your students on the side for extra side money. So saying, hey, I'll tutor you during lunchtime for an extra fee. Um, it mainly works if they are your students. So you can't charge your own students extra money for tutoring um, during normal work hours. Now, if this were something like over the summer when you're technically not on the clock, then it's okay. Um, if it were not your students and it was off the clock, so maybe I'm tutoring, I'm a second grade teacher, maybe I'm tutoring fifth grade students students in math over the summer, that's fine, but you can't um, ask for extra compensation during the work week for tutoring your own students during the regular um, approved schedule. Um, also, any side jobs that you do, which invite, it might inv involve coaching, um, athletic camps, summer camps, um, um, you know, teaching summer school, uh, doing different club sponsored events, you want to make sure that those are approved, um, if, especially if you're going to get uh, paid in addition to them, because you can't um, just say, hey, I did all these extra things, and now I want to get compensated for it. So, you know, it needs to be, it's probably going to be a contract up front that says, hey, I'm going to do these coaching duties, I'm going to do these um, club sponsoring duties, whatever, and I'm going to get paid for them. And if you don't have a contract, then you can probably bet that you're not going to get paid for them and they're just going to be part of this uh, part of the gig as being a teacher. Number seven is a big deal. It deals with confidential information. Um, you want to be very careful about what information you give out um, about a student and to who you give it out to. Um, and so what types of information is confidential? Um, performance evaluation of school personnel, which you know falls more into the the um, Leadership role, so if I were a principal, I couldn't just give my teacher's evaluations out to anybody or post them on, you know, a wall or on Facebook or whatever. It has to be, you know, a private matter. Um, health insurance um, information, um, student performance data information, um, records of students, including those with disabilities, um, educational records, all those type things. All those have to be kept super super confidential. Um, when we were kids, we had folders that were kept in the office locked away and the teacher would have to go and check out the folders and put all their data in the folders. Nowadays, it's all done um, on computer systems, but you do have to log in, log out. Um, it's time tracked, that kind of thing. So you want to be very careful about what um, and who you you share that information with. Oftentimes there is a contact card when the student um, enrolls into the school of who you're supposed to contact. So mom, dad, grandma, whoever is the legal guardian, that's who you contact and that's who you give the information to. Um, if, you know, dad's not on the contact card and he comes up and wants to have a copy of the student's record or wants to talk about their test scores, um, you want to definitely involve the main office to see if you can indeed talk to him about that. So you want to be very careful about who you talk to and what you talk to. Standard number eight um, is abandonment of contract. This doesn't happen that often, um, but when you are each year, a teacher signs a contract, um, and that contract usually runs from August to July. Um, so it runs all year long, even though you're not actually teaching over um, the summer usually. Um, and so you sign this contract, and it's basically saying you're going to do these duties and get paid this much money. Um, now, sometimes what will happen is a teacher abandons the contract. They just say in the middle of the year, hey, I quit. I don't want to do this. Or sometimes what will happen is they sign a contract with one school system, and then a couple months later they are given, um, they're offered a job by another school system that they would prefer, and they want to go and do that uh, school system. If you've already signed your contract, however, you have to break or get out of your contract with the first school to be able to sign with the second school. If not, you can be abandoning your contract. So this involves things like prior release, again, just leaving your job for another reason during your contract period, um, but it also involves um, refusing to perform the services required by contract. So if it says that, you know, you're supposed to be at work at 7.30 for morning duty and you say, I'm not doing that, I'm going to get here at 8.00. Um, or if it says, hey, you are not going to have duty-free lunch, you're going to watch your kids during your lunchtime and you say, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to sit in my um, sit in my classroom and eat by myself, that is falls under the standard because you're refusing to do things that are in your contract. 
Standard number nine is very important, um, and it involves um, making reports and um, or failure to make a report. So as a teacher, you are considered what is known as a mandated reporter, which means that you have to um, report any type of suspected abuse or negligence towards a student um, so if it's in it it doesn't even have to involve if you actually physically see it so if you you know see a bruise on a child and you say hey what happened there and they give you some story about that you think might involve abuse you do have to report it um, even if it's just a matter of the student has gotten head lice four or five times in a year which is more often than not you still want to report it um, you cannot get in trouble for reporting something that turns out to be false. So say that um, a student, you know, reports someone in their home hitting them um, and you uh, report it and it turns out not to be true. Of course, the parents may be angry with you, um, but again, you cannot be, uh, you cannot be penalized in any way for making a good faith effort. What you can be penalized for is if a student tells you information and you do not report it, um, you can you, it can fall under a standard nine or failure to remake uh, to make a required report. So again, when in when in uh, when in doubt, definitely report it. So, it, but this involves more than just sexual or physical child abuse. It can be things like a known violation of code ethics. So, if you know another teacher violated the code of ethics and you don't report it, you can fall under standard nine. Um, if you know another teacher uh, or yourself broke a federal or state law then that um, could fall into that. If you knew that there was a violation um, in federal or state testing and you did not um, and you did not report that, then that can fall under this. And that's what happened a couple of years ago with the Atlanta cheating scandal. Um, a couple of teachers knew what was happening. They didn't report it. So that fell under standard nine for them for failure to uh, make a report. And so here's an example of a couple of uh, testing violations. It's not just a matter of copying the test or telling the students the answers. It can be changing the students' answers. It can be discussing the test items um, during, uh, before, during, or after the actual exam, um, publishing the test items, maybe taking pictures of them or making, making a note after the fact and you know putting them on a blog or something or emailing them or texting them to people um, or coaching or providing help to students students during the test and so again most of the time teachers just when a student asks a question we just say do the best you can use you know the strategies that we've learned and keep moving so um, but all this can be considered a testing violation which can fall into that standard nine um, of the code of ethics standard 10 is very much a catch-all and it involves um, professional conduct um, that can that can possibly uh, hurt the dignity and integrity of the teaching profession um, and so here are some examples you'll see that some of them are not even directly related to teaching things like not paying child support um, not paying your student loans gambling with students having weapons at school um, having disciplinary actions in another state leaving students unsupervised leaving work hours without permission all of those kind of like a catch-all can fall under standard 10. So what happens if you do violate one of these standards? Um, the Professional Standard Commission has the ability to suspend, revoke, or deny your teaching certificate. Um, they can also reprimand a warning um, or monitor the educator's conduct and performance um, during an investigation. So it might be kind of like on a probationary period that you go um, that you go through if you have a violation, and then if it you know doesn't, if it's not fixed or if it continues, then you can have your license suspend, revoked, or denied. Now, if you have had your certificate revoked, denied, or suspended, um, during that time, not only can you not be a teacher, but you cannot be um, a volunteer as an educator, a peer professional, a substitute teacher, or any other profession involving um, or falling under the Code of Ethics. So here are some examples um, of real life situations and what standard um, what standard it involved and what uh, what the verdict was. So there was an educator that pled guilty to two counts of theft by taking for stealing gasoline from the school system, um, and that that uh, broke standard number one. And they had one year of suspension. So their their license was suspended for a year, which meaning they couldn't do anything related to the teaching field involving substitute teaching, um, you know, paraprofessional, anything like that for a year. 
So in this case, the teacher admitted that he consumed um, one alcoholic beverage after hours on a three ni- on three nights while serving as a chaperone on an eight-day school-sponsored trip to Italy. Um, that broke standard three, and he was suspended 20 days. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with drinking alcoholic beverages after hours on a normal night. Um, the issue is, is that he was a chaperone on a multi-day field trip. So he was having to watch the students day and night because it was an overnight field trip. So that's where the issue came into. In this case, a coach opened multiple bank accounts with school funds um, without the school's approval, which again, maybe there wasn't malice in that. It might be that he, you know, simply opened another account to be able to put, you know, t-shirt money or, or, you know, shoe money or whatever in that area. Um, The checks that were, the checks that were written were written to cash or to the educator and then um, again, probably the, the deal was that the parents were just writing them straight to the teacher and he was going to put it in this account and then he was going to write one big check to the vendor to pay for all the things. It was probably innocent enough, but you cannot do that. And that broke standard three and he ended up having three years of suspension. This one involves um, lying about why you're taking leave. So this educator put in a doctor's excuse for the days that she attended an out-of-state event with her daughter and her husband. Um, And that broke standard four, and that was a five-day suspension. In this case, the teacher changed the grades of students um, in her class um, without documentation to show the um, reason for the grade change. And she said it was done to benefit the students, but that did cause uh, that Brooks Standard Forum was a 10 day suspension. So this one is more of a um, severe case where the teacher used alcohol before coming to school. Um, and on the way leaving school, um, left the school without permission to obtain more alcohol, um, became disoriented in the classroom, had been arrested and charged with sexual battery of a high school student and furnishing alcohol to, to a minor um, the previous day. And in that case, that broke a lot of standards um, in standard three and his license was completely revoked. So usually, maybe if he did an appeal, but probably not going to get it back. In this case, uh, the high school principal failed to report rumors that a female student was involved with a male teacher um, until after the teacher was arrested and charged with sexual assault. And again, it might be that the principal didn't believe it. It was just a rumor. He wanted to hold on to it till there was clear evidence. He didn't want to get the teacher in trouble if it turned out to be false. He was afraid of how the, how the uh, school might be impacted, how the parents might see that teacher, how they might see him as a principal. So he failed to report. Um, and that broke standard nine. And he was given one year of suspension. So, of course, the teacher was... Um, the teacher got in trouble, but the principal himself uh, went under one year suspension for that. So again, if there is any speculation, it's best to go ahead and report because if not, and it turns out to be true, you can be in trouble as well. In this case, the principal exchanged um, a bunch of text messages with two female students in a two-month time period that contained um, inappropriate discussions that broke standard two, and it was a two-year suspension. In this case, an academic coach um, was given management of funds, um, and she used those funds to employ her relatives um, to fund um, other expenditures, um, as well as to pay for her um, pursuit of a higher degree. So you're, again, not able to use funds for however you want them to. Um, A lot of times, if you are responsible for funding, things like, you know, academic coach, um, other types of coaches, oftentimes you are given an allotment of money. You want to make sure that you keep data um, and a record of where you spent that money and why you spent it that way and how you got approval to spend that money. And then the last example we have is an educator who carried a yardstick and would hit students on their legs um, in gym when they're um, as well as allowing students um, to be in the gym when they weren't supposed to be there, so they would just come and hang out, um, and allowing a student to watch his son in the office instead of attending gym class. So the student didn't want to do gym. He said, fine, you can just go in my office and watch my kid while I teach. Um, And again, all of that breaks standard 10, um, which is kind of the catch-all because you can't hit students, um, you can't allow students to be places they're not supposed to be, and you can't use a student as a babysitter during class time. Um, So that broke a lot of different things um, which falls under standard 10 which is kind of a catch-all and resulted in a 30-day suspension. 
So again, a lot of this information is kind of self-explanatory. A lot of this probably isn't a surprise to you, but some of it is. Um, sometimes small things like failing to report um, can cause you to get into big trouble. So you want to make sure you know what the code of ethics is and what it involves so you can make sure not to break any of these policies.